It's a huge honor to be invited to give this, uh, this talk. And I'm really grateful that um, so many of you haven't just thrown in the towel after Ariane talk, which is the erudite one, and uh, so many of you are waiting to listen to me. So um, I, I thought that we, I know that some people may not know where um, Manchester is and where we work in Salford. And I thought we might just have a, just a couple of slides about that. So we uh, are here in the north of England in Manchester on the outskirts. Manchester, uh, probably a lot of you just know for some uh, football teams and some uh, grim up north post-industrial desolation. In fact, probably it's maybe not just quite as bad as all that. But we don't actually work in Manchester. To get to our uh, hospital, you need to cross this uh, river here, the River Irwell, at the Salix Ford, the Willow Ford. And that, of course, gave to, it was allied to form the word Salford. And then we're just a little bit along the motorway here. And the River Irwell then becomes the Manchester Docks, which become the Manchester Ship Canal, which go down uh, to the sea in, near Liverpool. Um, and um, I, I, I'm just about old enough to almost remember the hospital when it was like this. Um, then they knocked all this bit down and built a shiny new bit, and now they're building an even shinier bit with this um, dinky little helicopter landing in the artist's impression for us to be the major trauma centre for Manchester. Salford's also uh, famous for two other things. Firstly, uh, N.S. Lowry lived here for quite some time, and this is our, our waiting room at Salford Royal here in the old good old days. And it's not really Salford Royal. And uh, what I hadn't realized till I was preparing for this talk is that he did some little anatomical sketches. These are, I put the hand ones in, but there are different ones as well. They are not quite Da Vinci, but they are an interesting footnote as well. And finally, uh, uh, Eccles, which is in part of Salford, just next door to our hospital, was the hometown of the Mayo brothers. So naturally, we've cashed in on that, and we have the Mayo building for our postgrad centre and our executive suite of offices. And in the entrance, there's this slightly psychedelic colour-changing um, model of, of William Morrill Mayo made out of test tubes. So that's the end of the Salford Tourist Office um, presentation. And we're going to move on uh, to talk a little bit about systemic sclerosis. And I thought it was important that we had a medical overview because primarily these patients should be managed by rheumatologists with an interest. And they should come to us for a bit of help afterwards. And so uh, that's me. I'd like to start off by showing you the, the, this lady's hands. And this was, I think, the first person that I treated with systemic sclerosis and Ariane kindly sent her over. And she sort of burnt into my brain a little bit because um, I hadn't seen systemic sclerosis training. And she came over with her right index finger a bit blue at the tip and ulcerated. So I thought, well, good surgical principles, let's take this off. And then we kept um, the briding and the briding and the briding, and eventually we got back to some bit that was bleeding reasonably well and stitched up, and she more or less healed up. There's a bit of scab still to go here, and I thought that's great. I've helped this this poor lady, and um, moved on. And then, of course, the inevitable happened. She came back a bit later with the same in another finger and another finger, and then she lost most of her fingers, and then she had some leg problem and lost her legs, and then she had some other completely unrelated problem and died quite young. And that was I. I think about her and think I must learn to do better than that. So what are the problems that people present with in, in the hand when Ariane sends them over? And I'll, I'll let you just take a note of the list there and we'll work our way through and show you some examples of these. I've deliberately not gone mad on facts and figures and tables and percentages. I've tried to show you a little bit of the overview of what I've seen and what I've dealt with and the patients uh, Ariane has kindly been entrusting to me over the years. So Reynolds, uh, as you know, was first described by Maurice Reno, and the bulk of the Reynolds disease that we see is related to systemic sclerosis, as Ariane has probably explained. And um, I, I can tell you with absolute certainty that this patient here has given permission for his uh, hand to be uh, photographed to be on this top, because this is my hand. And my Reynolds has been really bad this year, actually. <laughs> I hope that this is not my um, capillaroscopy. Ulcers. Now, ulcers are, seem to be the sort of, for the rheumatologist, the defining moment of systemic sclerosis. And a lot of the 
trials and the, and the literature and the drug treatments rely for their uh, assessment on whether ulcers are there or pre healing or getting better or getting worse to the extent that there's a whole book about them. And uh, quite often they're here underneath the nail, as you see in these pictures, sometimes they're overlying joints. But then uh, this sort of exemplifies the difficulty. This one here in the bottom right, is that an ulcer that's healing, an ulcer that's healed almost, or an ulcer that's developing? And that was quite difficult. And I spent a, an afternoon in a darkened room with the rheumatologist one time trying to work out what we all thought, and we found it was quite difficult actually. And of course, the ulceration often reflects, is it just a reflection of ischemia? And, and the next step in ischemia is um, necrosis. And uh, you don't need to be a brain surgeon to work out that this poor lady's not got enough blood supply to her fingers. And then the necrosis can become more severe and develop into mummification. These you can leave to demarcate and they will just come off and just tidy them up as usual. And another um, uh, aspect is sclerodactyly or perhaps acrolysis. And the unfortunate thing for these poor patients is that they often end up with this bit of nail sticking out, which is not so pleasant. Now, um, Mr. Goddard asked, was I going to mention calcinosis? And of course I am, because calcinosis is also quite a salient feature of systemic sclerosis. And uh, sometimes it's quite minor, but sometimes it's pretty horrible, like this poor woman's thumb. Sometimes it spits out bits of calcium, like this top left picture in the middle here. And sometimes um, it sort of protrudes through the skin. And sometimes it comes out like toothpaste. And um, so we've been looking with Ariane to do some analysis of this calcium. I, I did try once um, with the aid of the kidney lysotriptic doctors to see if we could break this down enough that it would come out like toothpaste to save the patient's operations. And then the final thing is joint stiffness and digital deformity. And this, I know you've seen this picture already, but this is the characteristic deformity of IP flexion and MCP extension. Okay, so we've seen that the patients have presented with a range of different symptoms and signs, and now we need to see what might we have in our surgical armamentarium to help. So we've got all these things here, and we can match these a little bit to the problems on the left-hand column. So we can debride ulcers. Of course, I've made a slightly um, arbitrary distinction here between ulcers and uh, renos and so on, because really these are part of the same ischemic spectrum. Calcinosis we can excise, and then joint deformities we can fix somehow or other with surgery. I think before we consider any of these, this to me is the most important part of, um, of providing a surgical service for your rheumatology colleagues, is the door to your outpatient clinic must be open. And we're lucky because Ariane and I both have a clinic on a, Saturday, on a Wednesday morning. Ariane never has to send me an official referral. She just phones or texts and says, I'm sending you Jeannie Smith. And the answer always has to be yes. These poor patients are in the main all lovely. They are extremely stoical. They are putting up with a really horrible disease that you've heard is affecting their whole body. And um, so why make it difficult insisting on them having to have an, uh, an appointment in card and triplicate before they come up? You're going to see them anyway, so why not just see them today? So let's look a little bit in more in detail at some of these um, operations. Also debridement. So now the patient on the right hand picture, the sort of slightly greeny bluey tinged one, nobody is going to dispute that you should operate on that because you can see the pus coming out. But what about the patient on the bottom left? So this patient might come to you with a lot of pain and you look and see, but there's not very much to see there. They've got a little bit of uh, sclerodactyl and they've lost a bit of pulp, so they have this hook nail. But sometimes it's worth just exploring these. And let me show you why. Here's a patient on the top left. You might think there's not very much to see there, but in fact, underneath all that, they have this bead of pus. And when you let that bead of pus out, it lets the wound heal up and it gives them a huge amount of pain relief. It's interesting, these patients don't tend to have this fulminant infection that um, might 
and you or I might uh, cause us a, a problem with our, our fingers and, and cellulitis, they don't often get quite so much as you might anticipate, but by the same token, they take a long, long time to heal up. So debridement, um, I go back to, to Maria's case there, I don't think you need to go berserk with your debridement, just tidy up the wound a bit until you see a bit of blood, and you're not going to see blood gushing onto the floor. So I think Ariane showed you this lady in her presentation, the lady with a bit of osteomyelitis, maybe we'll give it a good clean up. Here's how it starts, a little bit of cellulitis surrounding it, not very much in the way of blood getting to her hand. Um, operation, tidy that up, and you won't get very much more blood than that. Notice here, this is probably tendon or it might even be joint articular surface. Don't stress too much if you see the joint exposed and the bone of the PIP joint that can heal over, even in patients with systemic sclerosis. So don't think, oh my goodness, the, the joint is exposed, I need to do a local flap because um, you will find that not so easy with this hard skin. And here we are, we've debrided it and we've gone from the starting point to this and the wound is healed over. Another patient with some, some uh, dead yuck on the tip and so we've debrided that and then we're going to inject some Botox. We'll come back to Botox in a moment. Okay, so the, on the necrosis ischemia spectrum, there are a number of things to consider. Let's look at some of those. Botox. Now, I, the, I have to say that our results with Botox have been mixed, but there is some support for this in the literature. I hope Dr. Normeister won't mind me having used this lovely picture from his paper. We used the Allergan, that's botulinum toxin A. There is no number for the dose to give. Uh, it says up to 100 units because it, it's 100 units in the ampoule, and I usually just distribute it among the number of white spaces I'm going to inject. So if we're doing all, all, all fingers, then we split it up across the white spaces, and if we're just doing a couple, then each finger gets a bit more. And the long-term results are not so certain, but um, it's a pretty easy thing to do, and some patients do undoubtedly benefit. The next step up is a sympathectomy, and you may have heard of cervical and uh, peripheral sympathectomy. Again, this was studied by Reno himself in, in rabbits. And cervical sympathectomy is interesting because the evidence is that in the short term it is effective, but you may get a rebound, and the rebound uh, increase in sympathetic tone may come six or even 12 months afterwards, so it can come on quite quickly. Now, when we wrote the chapter in, in Rutherford, the editor was very anxious because um, we said that the cervical sympathectomy is not ideal. And he said, but that's what we do a lot in the States. But that was my reading of the literature. So that was all that we could put in. So here we probably go for peripheral sympathectomy. And I'm going to mention three different kinds. One is really historical only. Uh, Lariche, uh, who uh, was in Lyon, uh, um, uh, describes excision and ligation of the thrombus artery because he thought that that reduced the sympathetic discharge. This is probably um, historical now, um, but maybe Xavier Giffey knows better. Uh, Xavier, if you know, let me know. And um, if, we, if we were going to do this, we'd probably put in a bypass graft. So we're on to periarterial sympathectomy, and we can do that at a number of levels. We can do it at the radial and ulnar artery, or more distally, or we can do it a bit of each. By the time these patients pitch up in your clinic, about 50% of them will already have a thrombosed or ulnar artery. The ulnar artery seems predisposed to thrombosis. And this is a picture from Merritt's paper in hand clinics, and he described this quite extensive sympathectomy and quite extensive incision. We tend to be a little bit more conservative in our approach. So here are some pictures. This is a patient with this characteristic periungual perionicheal uh, necrosis that we described earlier. See, he's already lost a finger. I like to make Brunner incisions in the web space, but do what seems good for you. And then it's fairly straightforward. Here's the digital nerve. Here are the extraneous branches of the digital nerve. And here's the artery. And what we're going to do is just gently strip all this adventitia off. Aren't these beautiful pictures? It was a, a, a Photographer who's left us took these. And these are the nicest pictures of periarterial sympathectomy I've ever seen. And I don't take any credit for that. That's that's all down to her. 
So a couple of top tips for doing this. One is if it starts to bleed there, you are operating right in the sump of this wound. So it will be, make your life difficult. And two, it's really tempting to do the thing that you do when you're a, a novice and you're doing some microvascular repair and you do the easy bits on the top and then you find you've got to go around the back and it's more difficult. So leave yourselves a little bit of cuff of this tissue here that will let you lift up the artery and lift up the, the uh, advent tissue and just gently strip it off. And usually you can strip it off pretty much with your fives or with a bit of um, curved microscope. I do it under the microscope. Um, clever people do it um, just with their loops. And then when you've finished, or you think you've finished, get the tape measure of the nurse's trolley that came with the marker pen because you want to make sure you've done two centimeters. And it's easy to think, oh my goodness, I've done kilometers of, of the Breitman, and in fact, you've done 1.1 centimeters. Now, we mentioned also arterial reconstruction. This is a paper from Korea, and Kim and his co-workers described these six patterns of disease, uh, one, two, three along the top, four, five, six along the bottom. And they came up with this algorithm this is quite interesting paper. I'll show you some pictures from their paper, which I hope they won't mind and will forgive me for recycling, but to make the point. So they have a rather more um, ag aggressive approach. They mention, if you look here, balloon angioplasty. They mention a lot of um, uh, vessel graft and they prefer arterial to vein graft. Digital sympathectomy comes in here, radical digital sympathectomy. Um, but they start off correctly, of course, with the medical treatment. So let me show you some pictures from their paper. That is a whole lot more invasive than the operation we've just shown you on from our patient. And this is a vein graft in the index finger. I don't think I have the surgical skills in a patient with systemic sclerosis to do vein grafts like that. And I'm not even sure how much benefit you might get from that. Arterialization of the venous system. Uh, uh, it's not new. This is Alexis Carell, who is a vascular surgeon from Lyon. And um, he described it first in 1902, but there have been a number of papers. I think it's probably only fair to say that these are quite short and small series. And I haven't um, tried this, but I guess perhaps I, I should. It seems a sort of an extremist uh, thing to do. If you get to the stage that you have got to take some bits of finger off, might not do it for here. Um, I don't think that you need to go to follow the, you get greens out and say, right, well, what's the amputation level that I should be doing? Just take off the minimum that you think will allow some healing um, because um, otherwise you end up with a lot of shortening of the fingers. And probably you should always think about once I've taken this off, then how am I going to revascularize the finger and at least do some Botox? You can do that easily at the same time. I have had a couple of problems with infection from doing sympathectomy at the same time as debridement. So I have taken to just doing the debridement, especially if it's infected, give some Botox, temporize, and then come back and do sympathectomy if you need to later. Carcinosis. So for Mr. Goddard especially, um, the calcinosis looks dead uh, inviting here, doesn't it? You just make an incision, squeeze, all these little bits pop out like peas out of a pod, and then you stitch up, and then it's tea time. But of course, this calcification is not sitting inside the normal tissue, it is replacing the normal tissue. And when I started, I started debriding this and opening up the whole finger and then cleaning it all out laboriously and trying not to get the digital nerve uh, with it and so on, and then stitching up, and then uh, it came back and so that wasn't such a great idea. So now I tend to go for a rather lesser aggressive um, approach. And these carcinosis doesn't need to be just in the hand. This lady's got it in her knee. This lady's got it in her elbow. So it's pretty horrid. Um, if you've got small deposits like this, it's not such a big problem. Um, this, is, uh, this was not mine, but I put it in here for amateurs of pyrocarbon. Uh, this uh, lady makes uh, one useful point is that if you take out, when you take out all this calcium, it doesn't leave you with a normal tissue, as I say, it leaves you with a divot like this. And so um, for that reason, now I tend to debulk rather than trying to get rid of all the calcium. And you can do that, I tend to do it, so it's small open incision, and then either with a McDonald's or with a curette to scrape out what will come out. Mr. Goddard has described 
and it is published uh, using a high-speed drill and burning it out. And Roger Markison in Manchester used to do that also. I've always been too frightened, Nick, of um, getting out the long stringy white thing on the end of the high-speed drill. Joint stiffness and digital deformity. Um, well, this is more a sort of textbook than my practice because my ex uh, experience of MCP arthroplasty with silastic, even taking out a huge amount of bone, was that the finger was just as stiff post-op as it was pre-op, and I've sort of abandoned that. But if you want to, to try, then these are the described techniques. And um, this lady here, this lady exemplifies these patients. So um, these are photos taken when she was in the ward recently, but a lot of these patients will send in photographs. And you know, normally you get a photograph, it's either taken from the other side of the, of the room or it's taken so close up that it's fuzzy. Well, these patients all send in beautifully lit and beautifully uh, focused photographs. And this lady, both of her hands look like this. And I said, how did you manage to get that photo? And she holds the camera with her camera phone with her one hand. She puts her other hand in front and she presses the shutter release with her nose. So that's uh, the resourcefulness that they have. So on the other side, I've taken her thumbnail off and she's delighted with that. And that might be all we need to do. And then here, she's actually got very good MCP flexion, but stiff IP joints. So I've agreed that I would try and fuse this for her. but. Um, well, next, if, if there's ever a, a sequel to this talk, then um, I'll let you know how we got on. But she says, listen, if it doesn't work out, just take it off. It doesn't matter. So I'm happy to try it. And then sometimes you get sort of more complex um, problems. Uh, this um, poor lady is a farmer and still working. And she came with this horrible looking hand and this horrible looking x-ray. And look at the calcification all the way up the tendon here. And look at the sublux DRUJ here, and look at the inflammatory arthritis here, and the subluxation and the effusion. And then on top of all that, she has also got fingers that look like this. This is characteristic of um, patients. They all do their own dressings, and they come up with their own dressings, and they're often quite particular. They don't like to do that themselves. They don't let you pre-dress them. And I know you're thinking, what is Lindsay Muir thinking of? Why has he not fixed this poor woman's fingers yet? What are you doing leaving them to get like that? And the answer is because we've been offering for quite a while and she was reluctant to come in and I can understand that. So um, it, it is pretty horrible disease really. Uh, the future. So there has been some talk about fat grafting. I haven't tried. I know uh, Maritza Kakani in Zurich has tried a little bit, but um, I think that's a, probably for the future at, at, at present. So I was trying to sum up, and I, I think I probably roughly agree with this um, algorithm that Thibodeau has uh, produced. It, the, my only thing about it is he's not put Botox in here anywhere, but I thought it was probably a, a good, uh, reasonable uh, an approach if you want an approach to go and look up. So it starts off with medical optimization, that's good. Intractable pain still, you could do vascular imaging. We have difficulty in getting vascular imaging. But then he's got sympathectomy, bypass plus or minus sympathectomy, venous arterialization as a last resort. And then rather unhelpfully, he's got recurrence of slightly fatalistic outcome. But I, I would probably put in here somewhere, maybe in here, Botox or something like that. So that has been a whistle-stop tour of what I hope I've learned. I, you know, I sit here and I think, um, I'm not entirely sure that I'm, if Maria came to me again now I would do so, so much better because it's quite a hard problem to treat, but I hope that we'd be able to give her some better relief and um, with aid of sympathectomy and Botox and so on and, and, and more minimal debridement, we would be able to help her a little bit. I'm really, really grateful to you all for listening. I'm super grateful to Carlos for inviting me and for you for not um, bowing out at the, uh, you were given such a wonderful opportunity to, to scoot off and go and get a, <laughs> a beer out of the fridge or, or, or whatever um, when we stopped over. So thanks again for all your patience and, and uh, that's it, look after yourselves. Thanks again. <laughs>